Yo, what's up, y'all? Today we're chatting with Masi of MetaBob. Uh, they use graph neural networks to conduct uh, contextual code reviews. Uh, we get into sort of the difference between uh, GNNs and LLMs. Uh, we talk about how uh, Masi kind of started an entrepreneurship, found his way basically to the cutting edge of using AI to solve business problems. Super interesting conversation. Learned a lot. This is like, this is the second interview that I did on the same day with like another genius. So <laughs> uh, I think you'll dig this one and um, super interesting one. So appreciate y'all and let us know. Bye. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Like, where are you from? How did you get interested in, I mean, programming, entrepreneurship? Just give me some background on you. I'm originally from Italy, northern Italy, a town right next to Torino. I don't know if you know, but it's in the north side, uh, pretty close to Milan. I initially, I, I got interested in programming when I was in my teens. Specifically, I started to become very interested in the open source side of it. So mm -hmm. I started contributing in different projects. Uh, it kind of ranges, but uh, uh, yeah, I definitely became a, an integral part of the open source community, both initially in Italy, then in Europe, like uh, I spent some time in London. And, uh, and that was like really what got me into programming in general. Um, just became passionate by myself kind of self thoughts in the beginning. Um, so mainly out of YouTube and just again, meetups and, uh, and all of that. And, uh, and then like, uh, what got me into entrepreneurship was really like, I wasn't chasing entrepreneurship per se. It's more like, you know, as I consequence of becoming passionate about programming and started to just build stuff for fun. And uh, most of that was pretty much pointless from a commercial standpoint. But yeah. until like uh, one uh, became like with, um, my first company, it was with uh, a professor and a, and a friend in Italy. And uh, it was again started off of projects I developed for school. And uh, classic story, I guess, uh, we I got asked to make it to actually put it like make it a company gain traction raise a bit of money and that's really how i started but uh, unlike a lot of entrepreneurs like i didn't really start with the classic like oh, let's try to find identify a problem a solution to the problem a business plan i just built something that had some success uh, in the early stage and someone with way more experience kind of mentored me to bring it to market right and of course i made a lot of mistake though in that <laughs> and all, all my initial projects that i wish i now know but uh yeah that's really how we started and uh, we raised money in, yeah, in the united states in this area that's why i moved to the bay area to also one of my ventures and i i study here as well uh, after that experience i was like maybe i need to get some experience in business as well so went to business school well, off the record, really, like, that's not really, doesn't really teach you anything about business, business school per se, but uh, <laughs> it's just like a good way to enjoy a couple of years of your life, I guess. Yeah, I feel like business school teaches you, like, how to be friends with rich people. I feel like it's good exactly. at teaching. That's yeah. it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially, like, I went to school here in Menlo Park. And uh, so, yeah, it's exactly as you say, it's really, like, it teaches you. I came from a very like uh, mid class, low mid class Italian family with like you know, right. I had to work pretty much my entire life, and I, all of a sudden I was surrounded by billionaires, and I was like, damn, that's that's a different lifestyle, I guess. Yeah, no, like like you go to Vail on the breaks, you kind of have friends that go out to all these spots, and you're like, actually, this is what happens when you. Yeah, it's it's a bit of anxiety, right? Like every everywhere every, <laughs> where you go, you're like always oh, them. Like I hope like they like you know dinner is not gonna cost me like a two month rent tonight, but yeah, totally. We'll yeah. yeah, yeah. What so what open source projects did you work on um, when you were first getting started? 
I, I mean, a lot of TensorFlow I've done. Um, so, and then like I joined a group, uh, we started a project actually open source called Kleist where, uh, that was really like one of my first bigger projects, um, with actually our current CTO. And, uh, the goal there was like building a framework and a governance system to enable actually open source projects to run better mm. and actually to enable monetizations to open mm. source projects. So this was kind of our goal, uh, because uh, I made a lot of friends all around the, the world, right. That were contributing a lot to projects, but obviously it's hard to make money in most cases, unless you get sponsored. And so that was kind of our, our goal and, uh, to kind of build a framework where first thing you have like, um, you select, you kind of come up, we came up with like a, we can call it a governance system, like almost like a constitution, we call it, where we was making decisions to each commit and how the projects needs to run. And then following that really like, uh, um, based on the value of the contributions and how much the contribution is used over time, we build a model to predict how much each contribution is worth from a monetary standpoint. And, and we kind of work with few bigger companies that implemented it, uh, to actually pay their contributors. So it actually went okay. Um, I think, um, it's still on a certain level running, like people are still sometimes using the constitutions, but, um, yeah, that was kind of like the, for sure, like uh, one of the biggest uh, um, projects I, I led. I join also a lot of groups. Uh, there is this group called GOP that I'm still a community leader. Uh, so to do, um, it's based in Europe. I mean, now they do a lot of things here in Mountain View, but uh, um, it's for, you know, Python projects and uh, um, a variety of like events that we organize really like trying to enhance the open source side of it. And, uh, yeah, and recently we actually work with a few groups in, um, uh, in India as well. Um, uh, this specific group called we make dev, uh, mm. which connected to also what I'm doing right now at Metabob. It's, uh, it's a very big part of our business working and partnering up with open source communities, contributors, influencers just to uh, make sure that, you know, they give us feedback. And uh, um, again, I'm very committed to it also in the hiring process. And uh, and so we partner up with the group. We do many hackathons. So we sponsor usually hackathons as well as uh, we try to do like a few events per year where it's not about the company per se, it's just about trends and like hiring tips and all that. What's funny is like just earlier today, we um, had a conversation with um, the original founder and maintainer of Homebrew. He's now got, got a, yeah, super cool guy. Um, and he's now working on this project called T.XYZ. And it's, it's pretty cool. Um, they're also, I mean, they're trying to also solve like this problem of like underfunded uh, open source projects. It's a thing. And it's funny. We had a conversation like there's a sentiment in the open source community where like they actually find money like kind of grotesque, you know, like a lot of folks just they're like, no, I don't want any money. I want to do this because I love it. You know, so it's just yeah. it's interesting. And that probably gets in the way sometimes. Um, but yeah, yeah, cool. but you know, for big framework, like uh, a lot of the things I was doing, it was like also in the beginning, especially aside from TensorFlow, like, you know, the big Python projects right. like Django, Flask, all of those, like, I think it's, that's really where I see the bigger opportunity when it comes to like, right. our huge contributors to monetizing. But anyway. So did you move to um, the Bay Area for Metabob or were you already here and then founded Metabob here in, in California? I moved here for um, my previous one of my previous venture for metabob like i was already there so i moved in the bay area in 2012 or 13 so it's been already about 10 years and the metabob we started in 2019 gotcha so it's been like um, i was already there at the time it was right before covid 
And then also, how did you come up with the name? So, you know, like in physics, Bob is like a, a thing. Is that the origin of the name or like how did it's you... A, it's a mix of that and Meta when we first started. First of all, Facebook wasn't called Meta when we started. If... Uh, and then Meta was like, uh, you know, there was like this concept of Meta programming, which yes. is really like out of code generation, right? It was kind of a combination of the two uh, that we put together. It was kind of random. But uh, I like uh, how it sounded. And I was like, yeah. Plus, Bob, like, I don't know. I feel like uh, we have a couple of team members that represent Bob. I don't know. It's a cool name. So we were like, yeah, let's do that. So it was kind of random. Same for the logo. We literally drew it like uh, at the time I was living with my CTO and uh, UX designer. And we were just like imagining how Bob would look like. and. That was kind of the look of it. Like I, I drew it on a piece of paper and our designer then made it a logo. I'm looking at it. It does, it does look like your classic, like kind of wizened neck beard programmer. You know, what do you imagine? Like the fucking genius who knows where everything is buried. That's it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. We just need to, yeah, right now we are actually like uh, thinking about, but like as we are getting more and more enterprise customer, like, uh, been growing like we are start hearing you know that being like a male uh, it's kind of discriminate <laughs> part of the community so you know all, all of that so that, that's that's what happens right as soon as you it becomes like from like a hacky projects to actually like gain like visibility then people are start calling you out on everything so it's it's a thing a meta day Something like this. We might. Uh, it's more like the logo. I become like a cat. Maybe not a cat like Gita, but like some type of animal. Maybe I don't know. We're thinking about it. What's best? But uh, yeah, we'll see. It's yeah. It's it's tricky because it's like you know you want to be more inclusive, but you don't want to do it in a way that seems to alienate like the original ethos of the company. And it's like it's always. It's like it's cool. It's the company's identity. I mean, we. We had a thing like many years ago where our tagline was like beards of experience, you know, mm. uh, on the site. Yeah. And we just had like a picture of one of my co-founder's friends. His name was Seth and he had a big beard on the site. And we got in so much trouble on Twitter. Like you guys are alienating female programmers. And we were like, dude, we just thought that it was a funny tagline. And we put our friend's face up with a beard. Yeah, no, you know? it's same. Yeah, <laughs> no, exactly. It's like, it's same goes for us. It's just a situation where you need to, yeah. I mean, it's a sensitive topic, and you know, I understand both yep. both sides. Um, Absolutely, it's it's just something like, yeah, you know, when you first start, you don't really think too much about like the how that's gonna look like in the future if you grow. But you just find like we found it funny. We were like, yeah, it looks cool. And like logo design is like less than one percent of the things that you're thinking about when you're first starting exactly. a company. Yeah. You know, yeah. you're just like, cool, that looks cool, move on. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So Meta Bob, so um what does your company do? We automate the code review and debugging process using AI. So the company started when I was initially at EIR at a lab at Princeton's lab uh, at Princeton, uh, the city from NAC sponsored by NSC, the Japanese company. And I was working with our current co-founder and director of AI, Ben, who has got 40 plus year experience in NLP and uh, different AI techniques. And per se, we were working on a, a model called graph neural, a type of AI technique called graph neural network, GNNs, uh, which was uh, pretty new, like initially published in, the, in 2017. And uh, for us, we were looking at it for the specific applications on fault call detections and, mm. you know, the refactoring, debugging, code review space. There are several benefits to that. Uh, we were actually comparing it with LLMs at that time mm. to see, like, uh, we were also looking at it for code generation itself, right? Um, and kind of like what we saw as one of the main benefits is really the ability to understand context within the code. Uh, first, obviously a graph, it's able to read content like code at its natural state, which is a huge benefit. 
uh, instead of reading it as a text, um, and represent it as a graph as well. And second, uh, um, a graph is able to really to, to see and understand different components within the code, even though they're not connected with each other and their semantic markers. So that's another aspect that we found uh, very valuable um, in the when we first started. So really what our bug mechanism, how it works is like, is based on analyzing the code with the GNNs and the GNNs are trained on a large data sets of code with the known bugs um, and then learn to identify patterns within the code uh, property graph that corresponds to potential issues. And then when presented with the new code, uh, Metable creates a graph representation of the code and applies the train GNN to analyze it for similar patterns, right? Um, and this is really possible to all programs being fundamentally represented at direct programs and uh, direct graphs, sorry. And that's really like uh, the main the main value of GNNs. And uh, and so we decided to kind of we first fo focus mainly on publications. So it was very new space. And um, mm. we we looked at we read a lot of papers and reach out to some of the people who brought the papers in the beginning as well. So well, one of our lead researcher, Dr. Aman, was kind of one of the pioneers in the space as well. And uh, we started working together. And so we started again, the first couple of years was really like publication focus to explore the space, um, to see if that was a good application of it. Uh, because there are also other sides that LLMs are better. Um, and so we were just comparing the two. And after a couple of years of, you know, just research, customer discovery, we actually thought, okay, there is a great opportunity for the main reason application I was referring to. And we decided to actually start a company. So we built an MVP. I, that's where really like I reach out to some of my open source friends to work together, build up a small team. Um, and in a couple of weeks, build the first MVP on GitHub and start getting some traction. And then that's when we raised the, the first round was in early 2021, like mid 2021. And that's cool. Officially started the company. The unique value of the tool is the type of problems it's able to detect. So, you know, to give you some context within like the, like debugging or refactoring space right now, there are mainly two types of companies. There are the more common linters or static analysis tool, right? That developers or company uses as a first check. Those are rule based. So they create a rule to, that, um, to identify problems based on similar patterns, right? Right. And those are mainly used for like syntax or stylistic type of problems within the code. Right. So it's kind of a first check. Uh, myself, from a developer standpoint, it's something that you, I, I never really liked, and both from companies I work with and myself, as they just generate so much noise, right? Meaning, like, in ninety nine point nine percent of cases, it's kind of pointless the detections they give you, so you end up not really looking at it at all, uh, because it's more the time you go through all the problems to actually the anything that finds valuable. And then obviously nowadays there are like LLMs like code generation tool like Copilot Chat, which was, I mean, specifically Copilot Chat on VS Code, which was released in May. Uh, they do offer like, let's say debugging per se. However, the problem with LLMs with debugging is one, LLMs are not very good in constructing context within the code. Um, and second, like you always need to prompt it, right? So. It's something where if you don't know the problem per se, if you just ask, oh, find me a problem, it's going to find something, but it's not going to find you necessarily a bug. And if, if you ask the same things again, it's going to find you something else, right? So yes. um, it's uh, LLMs per se, or when it comes to like, they, they, they have definitely a better use case for code generation than for refactoring or debugging your code. And actually in a lot of, Cases, if you use Copilot, you'll notice that code generated with Copilot actually create quite a lot of logical bugs or security vulnerabilities. So um, what we've seen a lot of our users are actually using us along with Copilot 
to debug the code that Copilot creates. Um, so going back to like kind of our differentiation is within the, we're kind of uh, so there are currently those are the two other alternatives for us. Our we use uh, our method specifically to identify logical or contextual type of problems within the code. So we have a way higher threshold, and uh, uh, our model enable us to find uh, problems that are based on like algorithm inefficiencies or you can think of all type of race conditions or handle edge cases um, memory leaks or web framework problems or let's say on python you use numpy panda sky sky kit any type of like data type errors data type errors or performance issue due to use of those modules so those are all the type of issues that we're able to find um, due to our technique and those are usually the one that really like take the longer right for developers to figure out why those occur so that's what right now kind of we focus on just to provide like a, uh, to detect issues that are uh, based on logic and context and then we provide our ai generate uh, recommendations to that so we we'll, our tool is pretty straightforward to use like you can use it either on your id or on as part of the CI CD. Mm. And uh, after you add it, like every time you save the code, you run some analysis, we flag the problems. And we do both like bugs or area that can be improved in terms of like uh, performance. And we flag it and we give you like without any input. And then we have a chat box you can ask them. So we, our AI creates like a, like explanations of like the, what the issue is and you can interact with it so you can ask different questions to rephrase it and then if you want to just apply we you ask for recommendations we create a code snippet so you apply it that's it mm. when it comes to recommendations we do use an llm for it because again llms are better when it comes to code generation itself um, but what we use with our gnns is we create a context stream that then we send to llms we we build our own llm in-house but we also enable users to use other LLMs if they want to, so if they use Copilots or any really any LLMs that they want to, um, and and we just send the context stream to those. So, what was like the un, like? How did you guys first like link the use of GNNs to a code review? And it seemed like at the time everybody was using LLMs, right? Like, how did you guys? make that connection well i think it was like uh, as part of our research it was really like we looked at the uh the what gnns are right and uh, what are the best application for it how they're used to map different uh, um correlations like in different industry like bioinformatics to like map molecules or they're used in different area right and uh, and it was really like Obviously, like our expertise were mainly in dev tools and like uh, our like knowledge as well when it comes to like a, like a space, both our core teams, that was the area that we knew best. And so it was definitely a mix of like, I mean, on one end, it was the most rational like part of it. So really looking at the value, the pros and cons of GNNs and what can be used for. And also through some, we did a lot of customer discovery, right? Um, so I talked to several friends or people I know, like we've done, I don't know, hundreds of customer interviews uh, in the very beginning where what we did is like, I just reach out to engineering managers or um, like CIOs, like a product or project managers just to mm. figuring out like the way each company does code review and uh, and if what was like some of the biggest concern right on their end when it comes to like obviously dev tool are pretty high when it comes to like uh, the cycle and so figuring out like what was some of the biggest problems there and obviously whenever you start a company you want to focus on a must have problem right or right. like a must have solution to a problem Right. And so, um, on a certain level, like, obviously, like we found a different type of feedback, uh, in different industry, but, uh, um, we thought that was a strong case and based on like the alternatives in the market, 
uh, we also thought it was a good timing because a lot of new research was coming out and uh, at the time when we actually started there wasn't i mean in the past few years you know the like ecosystem of dev tool have changed a lot <laughs> like it's yeah, been pretty true. crazy in the past four or five years so again when we first started it was a different environment and uh, uh, we, we knew that there was it was like uh, about to change and we thought it was a good time and and so it was a mix to answer your questions between customer feedback and just looking at the value the pros and cons of the technique itself and what was the initial use case we thought that could have been like it was a good uh, a good area to focus uh, due to competitor customer mm. uh, and uh, and overall technique for like the lay person of which I am one you know maybe it'd be helpful to describe the difference between how an LLM works and how you would train an LLM versus a GNN. And if there's any difference in the way that you would kind of construct these and utilize these for commercial purposes. An LLM per se are obviously deep learning model that uses like billion of parameter and an attention mechanism to predict the most likely token um, mm. to mainly to follow a given input, right? Uh, while GNNs, we use a um, attention mechanism that comprehends both semantic and relationship markers result res that results usually in a more complete representation of the input. Um, so usually the, the process we follow is like first the GNN detects and classify prob like a problematic code within contextual with contextual understanding. So we train it. LLMs usually are trained on the, um, the difference is like our model, we trained it on verified code changes so when we first started we looked at like github or different open source uh, projects so high quality open source projects we didn't train it on the code itself so what we do is we look at code changes and verified code code improvements and we look at it like why does it occur mm. so that's how we train the model in the first place um and uh, and then also over time like we have added obviously you look at stack overflow reddit and we've done a lot of company SOP, so company design standards and annotations. Um, also depends on the language, right? Uh, for languages like Python, open source enterprise version is almost the same. While for like Java, it's completely different, right? So uh, if you just train it on open source, it wouldn't be good. Uh, it wouldn't mm. like really apply to enterprise and uh, it would just have different application. So that's how we have trained it in the beginning. So, and all of that, um, again, it's um, then feed our GNN to learn kind of the best programming practices and to be able to map specific area of the code um, based on the uh, surrounding context. And, and then we like feed that, we create a context stream that we use for create recommendations. So we send to LLMs per set for the providing the recommendation to that. So again, the, the, when it comes to pros and cons, um, LLMs in general um, are very good when it comes to like, because of the way they function, based on user input, they can, they're good to predict a more likely, like a likely token following, um, which means like, their best application is usually for code or text generation. Right. Well, when it comes to GNN, so again, Metabo, we create a graph representation of the code. Um, the, the, the positive, the, the, the best side is one, we're able to read the code in its natural state. Right. Um, because again, all programs pretty much are fundamentally representable as a direct graph, right? Within each node of the graph, we specifically we encode information about the section of the code base and the edge encode when it's used, how data flows through it, and where it's located within the context of the nodes uh, in the code base per se. So uh, what that means is like our technique, the, the, the main advantage is really like understanding, uh, being able to read different components within the code, understanding the relationship between different components within the code that are not connected to each other, right? And really like, uh, and that's the main value of GNNs in general, uh, trying to map 
And even though the God. again, those components are not connected or their semantic markers are not connected, trying to figure out the relationship between those uh, through a graph. Well, LLMs don't do that. So again, GNNs are very effective when it comes to context understandings or um, yeah, understanding the logic of it. Well, there right now the use case is not as proven on when it comes to generating new code. So that's why we actually use LLMs for that side, right? And so the difference to cut it short, because I feel like I'm, <laughs> I'm giving like a way longer explanation than needed, but it's really like when it comes to use case, LLMs, code generation or text generations, the ideal use case. Well, for us, the ideal use case is like right now is to uh, debugging and refactoring. So understanding what's the logic of the code and why specific problems occur or how can specific area can are not performing as um, as needed, right? So mm -hmm. those are the difference right now. So we don't really compete right now with Copilot or right. any LLMs per se. It's not our intent to uh, compete in, as of right now. Um, obviously in the future, there is a potential when it comes to code generations as well, mainly using GNNs, but as of right now, we complement we complement uh, uh, LLMs. That's really what uh, we're planning and what we are doing. So a lot of developers or company are using us along with LLMs. One to provide better results when it comes by using LLMs, so better code. Because again, due to our technique, we create the context stream that can be used for both providing better code generations, as we have better context understanding of the code that we can, so we create inputs for Copilot, for instance, if you want to do code generation or um, we they use our technique for the uh, bug or uh, so to identify the tag bugs and then LLMs per se to create the recommendation to resolve the issues. So because your company is like basically, you know, working at the frontier probably of GNNs, it, has it been difficult to scale the engineering team, or are you guys able to find like good talent pretty easily? Like, what's that like as a CEO? In the very beginning, what we have done is uh, just reading papers and reaching out to people that wrote those papers. Oh, that's cool. I spend a lot of time just to like trade notes with different researchers at universities all across the world, really, like from Toronto to uh, Europe and uh, Amsterdam. So it was like, and that's usually has been my approach when it comes to the first stage. Whenever you, you you come up with something, you are in the forefront of research, right? You want to trade notes with the other few people that have been in the forefront with you. So yes, uh, they they have great feedbacks. And in, what I've noticed is in many cases, if what you're doing has value, you might actually find. Uh, you know, co-worker hiring through that process, right? So that's really what happened to us when we started. It was me, Ben, and Avi. And uh, we spent the first few months just reading papers, reaching out to the researchers that have brought it, getting into calls, trade notes. And that's how we found the first couple of co like partners or like um, researchers that work with us. Uh, and we got a few grants as well related to that. So working with researchers, obviously, they have great experience in writing grants. And so that's really what, before even raising money, what uh, was our approach. Um, yes. So when it comes to like the R&D side, that's what uh, uh, worked for us. When it comes to the the, the more like day-to-day -day development, yeah. I really tapped into my network of open source contributors. Uh, that's what I've done. Usually I found that uh, to be the most effective because in terms of quality and uh, and price, right? And yeah. uh, I've, uh, yeah, so that's helped a lot in the past, like uh, and in this company to just find people that I know already. They have a lot of things I can look at when it comes to commit and other expertise and I found good rates overall, so they enable us to keep a pretty low burn rate 
and uh, good quality because hiring that's like going back to like my previous center companies it's been it was very tough in the beginning yes so that's definitely something i learned over time uh and uh, and it's the most one of the most important parts right to make a company successful as you grow like finding the right people yeah that's uh that's kind of been our approach to it yeah it's a- it's so interesting because it's like when you hire, you can potentially bound like the scope of solutions that you have in front of you if you make the wrong hire. And then like you, it's like, and that can compound. They didn't hire people and you're like, shit, you know, where's, what are we doing? So cool. That's awesome. Ten, ten years ago, did you think that you'd be uh, running a tech company? Like, what did you think you'd be doing today? Well, 10 years ago, I probably would have thought that. Yeah. Maybe 15, really? 20 years ago. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think so because like it's when I first moved here and I I would say like when I probably my like 18, 19th is when I first like moved from like a, it became like from a just a hobby to something I kind of wanted to pursue as my, you know, there's nothing better in life, right, than doing what you love. Yeah. So I was like, Let's just try to make it a business, right? So find something that actually people use. Also, it's very rewarding. I think when you build something that people like and give you good feedback, I think that's a really what makes being an entrepreneur like it's the best part of it. Like seeing people using what you have built. Yes, I would say ten years ago, I was already like, I kind of, I mean, I hoped that was going to be the case for sure, <laughs> but. Yeah, when I was younger, I don't know. I wanted to be a like an astrophysicist. It was completely different uh, goals in life, but I guess that's a change. Do you find like your days these days being like? Are you still able to uh, program, or do you find yourself doing more business stuff these days? It's probably twenty eighty. Uh, mm. Right now, it's like. Uh, has been shifting more and more towards business activities. We have a fantastic team of developers that are better than me in a lot of area, right? And so um, you always want to be up to date anyway with like new technique, new framework. I mean, I still do a bit of the development for sure. Are you are you embracing the transition to becoming like a full-fledged like CEO businessman or are you trying to hold on to as much programming as you can? Um, I don't know. It depends on the day. Uh, <laughs> it's hard. I can give you like a yes or no answer, I guess. It's uh, yeah. some days I would want to just to like, you know, just program and like do that. Other days it's exciting to be a CEO, uh, travel, uh, we do a lot of conferences, a lot of competitions, and I mean, I love that part of it. But you know, when you are a CEO, the two main things you do every day it's like fundraise and uh, sell, right? So yes, I mean, I I don't dislike it. I think it's it's cool, especially like I, I like actually the business development side more than the fundraising side for sure. It's the fundraising per se. It's yeah. That part I will like happily avoid if I could. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, you gotta ask for money. I guess that's just that's what you do as a CEO, really. Yes, I I'm right there with you. I mean, we we like bootstrapped the company for a couple of mm. years and just kind of grew it out of revenue, and then we raised our first round. I mean, first institutional round. We had some angel money, you know. The business changes when you have professional investors, yeah. you know, and I can, exactly. I remember how it was before and I know how it is now and it's very different, you know? Yeah. I hear you on the selling. That's my favorite part too. I love selling and recruiting's fun too. I'm sure you do a lot of that too. Like yeah. trying to, trying to get on new people. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh yeah, that's, that's, that's fun for sure. I mean, yeah. Business development. I, I enjoy a lot, uh, but yeah, well, Again, as a CEO, so I guess that's it's a fancy word, but really what it means, you just beg for money all day. So that's what you gotta you learn how to, you learn to to do it and just embrace it, I guess. Just uh, until, uh, which is, uh, yeah, this company, I, 
you know, it's in a space where it's hard to be profitable very early on. Yeah. Uh, the same as you, like my very first venture, like we, we raised a tiny bit first, like again, angel money and in Europe, the ecosystem of investors is different. So yeah. it's hard to get like a lot of money yeah. at a very high valuation, unless you, I mean, pretty much in any case, but especially at seed or pre-seed. But so we actually were able to get to our revenue side, like almost profitable very early on. So uh, when it was like more raising just to push growth. But when you're working with, with AI, it's hard to, especially in the beginning, you have so much cost uh, from, you know, GPUs to cloud costs. Like that's obviously the biggest challenge of any like company within the generative AI space really is to um, maintain and like allocate resources in the early stage right with, without going broke and for us we have a free tool on vs our tool is free pretty much for um all the ideas and so our most of our users are using us through the free tier and then we have an on-prem solution for enterprises that can be run locally that's obviously doesn't cost us anything but uh, uh, most of our costs goes for supporting the free tier, which is obviously something we want to keep pursuing as, again, just to support the open source and getting feedback from developer, I think is key when you have a dev tool to have a tool yeah. that people can evaluate. Yeah, because of that, that's definitely represent our biggest cost right now, uh, just cloud costs in general. Yeah, cloud costs, GPU, even the, the labor cost of getting really good people and all of that's yeah. front loaded before you have a thing to sell. That's, yeah, that's just the nature of building something at the frontier. But I hear you. It's, um, it's funny. Like when we, when we first started the business, I actually just spent like eight hours a day going down angel list and just cold calling companies. Cause I was like, I don't want to ask anybody for money. We're just going to see if we can get some sales. Yeah. And then after a while, you're like, Okay, we need to have some people do this. This is crazy. So <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you got to do, I guess. Yeah. That's what you got to do, man. Yeah, totally. Well, as you look like two to three years ahead, you know, what's, what's up next for MetaBob? Like, what are you guys working on? What do you guys want to bring to market that you can disclose? You know? Yeah. So, well, right now, um, so we spent the first couple of years since fundraising to really focus on our free tools. So we initially were on GitHub. Then we just heard developers, they wanted to have the tool on the IDE side. And uh, it's just more interactive, right? We saw the trend. Everything is uh, moving towards left in the development cycle. So we now are available on VS Code and we're moving more to more and more IDEs. Uh, and then next few months will be available for most of those, uh, we're also, we started with Python only. And right now we're going to release in the next couple of months, uh, TypeScript, JavaScript, and C. Oh, nice. As supported languages. And we're already, we're already working on more languages support. Uh, our model per se is language agnostic. So all we have to do following up, um, a supervised model where all we have to do is like look at the categories, the model identifies for each language and, uh, Pretty much, it's not like a label in itself, but like uh, uh, we can just like, put a label in the category per se to make sure there is enough differentiation. So uh, it's usually a pretty straightforward word process to add new languages, and we do that for enterprises. Uh, but uh, since uh, April this year, we started to like monetize the tool. So we launched an on prem solution. We have already a couple of fortune 500 and uh, that's sweet. over 50 company in our SaaS. So we have like uh, uh, an on-prem side, uh, a, a big problem that we've seen in the market right now is related to legacy code. Mm. So a lot of companies that have dealt, have dealt with or have legacy code and complex code bases, obviously those usually, uh, they're hard to update and like they always, um, lack documentations and as time goes on, it becomes a bigger and bigger cost. Actually, we heard from companies that sometimes maintenance of legacy code um, costs almost 70% of their IT budget. Mm. So uh, what, they're, what a lot of bigger companies are using our tool for is to be able to, for maintaining that, 
the quality of it and uh, refactor legacy code. Uh, our tool, another great uh, like benefits of GNNs is it can be easily customizable. So we train the model on uh, customer annotations. So the review code history, and that provides way better results, right? For enterprises, for longer code. So in terms of like the next couple of years, that's definitely a market that we are penetrating more and more. And, uh, and so it's, uh, um, is where definitely I can see the shift a bit more to like just offering a free tool to get developers feedback, which has been uh, our like initial uh, objective following a bottom up approach. Uh, but now we are to a point that we keep getting new referrals. So the bottom up like is finally like it's definitely now, uh, getting us to a point where we're growing organically. We still don't really do much outreach at all. It's just through organic leads, which is really what I, we wanted when we first started. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in the first couple of years, like we're gonna focus mainly like adding language support. Um, on a SaaS side, we're getting you know the SOC two compliance uh, um, certifications that really to help us also to boost our SaaS. Uh, but definitely, that's gonna be our focus to grow our enterprise customer um, pipeline and. Uh, on terms of features, uh, we are just adding more categories and uh, um, it's always been a goal for us to be also as part of the code generation side. That's more like a longer term goal, but combining GNNs to LLMs, it's what we see is the ideal scenario to, for code generations. And we are, I'm sure it's going to happen. Um, I'm sure the big players are looking at it right now, and we've seen the past year or so a huge like hype around GNNs for applications. A company like Amazon are now using it, and uh, combining the two, I think, is ideal for code because again, the GNNs can provide great context understanding to create the context stream to, to be used to then generate code, and so um, we think. Uh, Either as implementing, uh, focusing more and more to develop our own LLM along with the GNN technique we've developed to do also cogeneration or partnering up with one of the bigger players, uh, for LLMs to do so. It's definitely in the cards for us for the next couple of months, uh, for the awesome. next couple of years, probably. And so awesome. Uh, that's the direction we see us going. That's awesome. That's exciting. Yeah, another great support we got. It was like, uh, we started as part of this, uh, accelerator, um, sponsored by NSC. As I say, like I was working at the EIR for NSC, uh, in partnership with like a researcher from NSC labs at Princeton. And, um, yeah, so that's actually helped us to go through the customer discovery part, right? Like they were very good in terms of like giving you a framework to test your assumptions. So because the technique we were using was pretty new and um, we were focusing on coming up with use cases for it. I think the key, it's always to test your assumption with potential customers. And so we went through like almost a year of customer discovery, like prompt by the accelerator at Tennessee X, uh, which really their goal is to match researchers with uh, entrepreneurs. And so, uh, I was working again. My is my role as 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 EAR. I was working with the researchers to test also the technique we were developing, and so that has been helpful for us for sure. Uh, that was key to also be able to apply the technique to uh, refactoring and debugging because thanks to the customer discovery part, we directly learned from engineering manager and so on with over five hundred uh, interviews to really get that uh, um, validate the need right and that's that's really was uh, what prompt us to start the company and to make it happen right those two years from 2019 to i mean it was 2019 and 20 i guess uh, where we went through an cx accelerator and then alchemist um, so i definitely recommend always when you start a company accelerators are always good i think they give you not just mentorship, but if you find the right accelerator to find, to get the right connections and like 
not just the framework, which usually the framework, you know, you can find on like YC school or there are a lot of resources, right. but also just to give you the right intros and trade notes with you, get a different perspectives. And then obviously demo day is always great. But that for us was very helpful, like, especially when, because we started working with researchers, um, having like the NACX side to give you that framework to, to like, and help you out to arrange customer interviews and so on. It was valuable for us, for sure. Shout out to NACX. <laughs> yeah. You said you are based in Nashville, right? Tennessee? Yeah. Yeah. National Tennessee. Yeah. Um, that's cool. You, yeah. You guys got to come visit. I mean, there are a ton of companies here now. So if you guys yeah. ever find yourself here for a conference, um, yeah. you need to come through for sure. We'll take you out yeah. for a beer. Also, just to, yeah, I've heard great things about Nashville. I love music too. So there is a, a great scene there. I, I'm definitely super down to, to, I've never been there before. So seriously. So do you, do you like live music, like country music, that sort of thing? I do. Okay. Hell yeah. Yeah. I actually was just, uh, we were finalists at uh, South by Southwest. So it was my first time in Austin. And um, Austin is also great for that. It's like they have a yes. fantastic music scene. Yeah. I'm used to the Bay Area, which it's quite boring. So <laughs> it's like I'm always down to travel, right? And so there is great, you know, great culture here, uh, great super like bright people but hey when it comes to like uh i don't know nightlife or just like social life it's not where you want to be so 100 percent. and i i every time i visit the bay area i'm like man these people are like too smart uh I, and i get kind of like i want to be around people that this sounds bad but i want to be around people that like don't do what i do and like I can talk to them yeah. about like other stuff besides your job and like what that's you're trying the thing, to build, right? yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I fully, I fully get that. It's like I mean, it becomes a bit overwhelming, right? So yeah, it's something I've noticed myself too. So it's good sometimes for me. I'll be going to Europe in a couple of weeks, and uh, that's a different life, right? Yeah, like people <laughs> in uh, in Italy or like I part of my family lives in France, so. It's just like, at least like you go there and you're like, it's a different mindset. People live to like enjoy life. They work to enjoy life, not to like, they don't like just to live to work, right? With the, while people here, it's, I mean, they're pros and cons to both, but it's good to have a nice balance. And, and France is like, you know, you work three hours, take a two hour break. Work maybe two hours and you ha then you're chilling. You eat your dinner at nine yeah. p.m. Wake up next day, yeah. go to work at ten. It's four or five days a week. You know here, especially in the Bay Area, you know it's like if you're not working twelve hours a day, people are like, "Are you, what's are you okay? Like what's wrong?" You know, right? It's yeah. very different. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean in Italy, it's uh, yeah. You, again, there are pros and cons. I think when of I course the year, I really like the like the opportunity and you have so much more like ambitious and drive to do things, to actually get things done. But then again, after 10, 15 years in the Bay Area, <laughs> like we go to Italy or like Europe and, you know, you just enjoy life for a bit and you're like, damn, that's, that's, that's living, right? It's, but then again, if I stay too long there, I become like, I can't want to get into like, I want to be more active in terms of like work. I think when you're in like 20, 30, that's really the time to hustle and get things done. So it's good to have a nice combination of the two. That's always the, the answer, right? Nice balance. Totally. I spoke to this CEO. She was maybe, she was based on, I think the Netherlands, like in Holland. And I asked her, I was like, what's it like building a company in Europe? And I could tell that she was like a capitalist and like very driven. And she was like, it's annoying when people take two months off in the summer. I'm like, I can only imagine what that's yeah. like if you're trying to build a company, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. especially like August, it's like pretty much like Italy's close in August. So <laughs> if you go there, like <laughs> you, you won't find any Italian really like aside from like the beach. You, yeah. <laughs> You go to like big cities, it's like 
close for business signs everywhere pretty much so that's uh yeah <laughs> but again if you are if you are living there it's like why not right like you live once and if you can just like uh, enjoy life if you you know the people there are different type of people and some are just like they're like okay i work to pay my bills and stuff but then the rest i want to just enjoy it and hey kudos to them to be honest if i could do that i wouldn't i would be very happy in italy the, just to enjoy totally it. Totally. The problem, yeah. and I'm sure you're similar, is that like for me to have my mind stimulated where I'm not bored, all the jobs are very demanding. Like everything that's intellectually gratifying just requires a lot of you every day. Exactly. Yeah. And, and there's no way, you know, back, I mean, even in India, it's the same thing. I found that there was no way to get sufficient intellectual stimulation. You know, if you work a government job or something like this, it's a very yeah. relaxed lifestyle, but you're kind of like going crazy a little yeah. bit. Yeah, I will never be able to do so. Like when I actually, when I, when I had my first company to like pay the bills and stuff, like I had, when I was like 16, and I had like, I tried billions of different jobs because I was already traveling and trying to like bootstrap it. And I work as a bartender, waiter, I work yeah. in a warehouse. <laughs> I literally work in a warehouse, like, like moving boxes. And like, it was this warehouse where like packaging books, uh, like school books uh, yeah. um, for like, and send it to schools, like a huge amount. So it was midsummer. And I was just by myself, like, like carrying billions of tons of books uh, <laughs> to pallets and shipping them. It was hot as hell. I picked up fruit. That was like one of my jobs literally during the summer, like go out to like field and pick up strawberries and stuff. So I tried everything, you know, like to, yeah. I mean, that was more like a F2 type of things to, because obviously my parents were like, hey, if you want like, to be an entrepreneur, you gotta like, we definitely can sponsor that. So I just like <laughs> try to like uh, make some money on the side because when you start as an entrepreneur, especially in Italy, like you make zero money for yeah. quite a lot of time, right? So I had to, uh, I, I tried everything, but at least I always had like the mindset. I'm like, okay, I'm doing this as like to be able to like make my dream come true. But I couldn't see myself like working for, as you say, like any type of like institution that you are just like every day you wake up, you do the same thing and then you go back home. Again, some people can and great kudos because it's like, it's great. I think great, like a uh, mentality balance. Uh, when I was younger, I was like more judgy towards that. But now yeah. I'm like, Hey, I actually, I'm jealous, right? I respect it a lot because it's like, if you can just enjoy life and see work and just, you know, you spend a couple hours a day just to do that. But then your life is actually spending with your family and like enjoy the small things. It's actually something I wish I could have as well. Like I just, my mind is not wired for that. It's just I become so bored so quickly for every time. And so, same. No, yeah, I, I often think that. But you know, it's like in a like a society. Like if we were in like a primitive society, like you need like there's a reason why our minds exist today after millions of years of evolution. It's like, yeah. there's a role that we play in society and we probably used to play back then. We're like, we're the people staying up at night thinking about random shit. That's, you know, yeah. and like trying to perfect some small spear to kill, you know, an animal better, you know? And yeah. we're not the people that stop hunting at 4 p.m. or whatever. It's just how it is, you yeah. know? <laughs> so. Yeah. To each their own, right? I think yeah. it's like, it's a good combo. You can't ever... Only people that's like, otherwise, like, will, will not function. And so, yes, uh, yes. I think it's good to have a, a mix. Uh, yes. I actually have one last question. Now we're running out of time, but why you ask the name of why Meraba? Why is Gan that I yo? What, uh, what does that come from? Back when we like first started, we were like a, um, a bounty site for open source projects. And so we were oh. like, hey, you, you could like hire a hired gun on the web to like hit this open source bounty. 
So that's kind of how we started. And we, you know, we, if you look at our site and if you look at kind of the branding and the app, it's all about like space cowboy. Like, I don't know if you watch anime, but we like cowboy bebop. Of course, and I like, do. Okay. Yeah. And so like, we like the whole theme of cowboy bebop. We like Western shit. And so that was right. kind of the original theme of the company. I like it. It's very cool. Thanks, man. Yeah. And trust me, we've gotten the whole thing around like gun. That's not good. And I'm like, dude, it has something to do with like a gun. Like we're not selling guns. We're just, it's like a cowboy, cow, cowgirl theme, you know? So yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. You gotta also like learn how to like filter different comments, right? Like if you listen to everything, then it's like you can move on. It's like, again, there is sometimes too much of that in my opinion. So. You guys are selling like, I mean, you're really like just uh, uh, connecting talents to company, right? So it's like, yeah, I don't see anything yeah. controversial there. <laughs> no, <laughs> totally. And, yeah. And the devs love, like, you know, the devs that use our platform, like, they like being like kind of professional, you know, mercenaries, you know, to go and do a project. It's, it's cool. It's a cool kind of like motif. I have an office in this house, but I, I like need to like make it kind of like a Western theme. So I just, I like like the wild West and I like the frontier. So that's kind of why we did it. Well, so I like it. So <laughs> Thanks, man. it doesn't matter too much, but uh, you get to one supporter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, I kind of feel like half the fun of like building a company is you get to define like your own company's lexicon yeah. and you have your team, you know, that's my favorite part. So where can people find you and um, Metabob on the interwebs? You can find us, obviously, metabob.com. Um, we are on VS Code Marketplace. So uh, again, the tool is free for every, any developers who like to check us out there. Give us feedback. We always love to hear that. Uh, right now, we are the tool is Python only on VS Code uh, for the free, free tiers. But in the next month or so, uh, we'll add the Java javascript and typescript support and c is coming as well in the next couple months and uh, you can also find us on github same things github marketplace or bitbucket and gitlab so obviously most of our users right now for the free tier are using us on vs code but if you have a small company you are interested to check it out check us out uh, github marketplace or schedule a demo to our website deployments and we can like give you a demo and tell you more about the company. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Massey. Thank you so much, Deja. I really appreciate it. And uh, I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thanks for listening to the Frontier Podcast powered by Gun.io. We drop two episodes per week. So if you like this episode, be sure to subscribe on your platform of choice and come hang out with us again next week and bring all your internet friends. If you have questions or recommendations, just shoot us a Twitter DM at The Frontier Pod, and we'll see you next week.